Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. Thank you so much for joining us for this online message. Here's our hope that as you hear the word of God preached, that you would see Jesus more clearly and love him more deeply. And so over the next few moments, take notes, focus, and hear how the word of God is going to transform you. If you got a Bible, go to Mark chapter 11. We're going to get there pretty quickly. Uh, but I do want to say one thing. Uh, as you came in this morning, uh, one of our team members handed you a, a set of small cards, little invite cards. Um, here's what we want you to do with those. Um, you wrote down a few weeks ago the names of five people or maybe more people on a card, and we just want to give you a small invite that you can give them. And so literally, it just has the, the imagery for our Easter series. On the backside, it has a quick little invitation, and then has a QR code where somebody needs to scan to find more information about what's going on. And so we just want to give you the opportunity to follow up with what you've been praying on. That if you've been praying, Lord, would you move in this person's life? Would you make an opportunity this season for them to come to know you? You can uh, actively make that invite with those cards that have been put in your hand. Um, they're not really all that good after this Sunday, so you should probably use them this week. Um, as we turn to our Bibles, uh, I think confession is good for the soul. And so I'm just going to start with some confession. I've never actually talked about this publicly, but I feel like it's important that I do so. Um, my, my parents watch the stream on a pretty regular basis, and I didn't warn them that I was going to share this, but I, it just feels like this is the moment in my life that I should do this. I'm 40 years old, and my whale that I can't catch in life is that I, my dad will still not let me mow the front lawn at his house. And so I can remember being a kid and Saturday morning was like the time that we like did our chores. And so Saturday morning he would be like mowing the lawn and like he would be like mowing like right up under my window trying to wake me up. And I'm like, if you've been doing that for the last 45 minutes, our house isn't that big. Like we should be done with the entire lawn. And so when I got out there and I'm ready to go, he'd be like, well, you can mow the back. I'm like, come on, man. Like recently, like three or four years ago, uh, he was getting ready to go on a trip to Ghana for some family business. And I was like, hey, while you're gone, do you want me to like come by the house and mow the lawn for you? He was like, no, I'll have our neighbor do it. And so I'm like, now I will say this, our neighbor is actually really good at mowing the lawn. And so he, you probably should have him do it. But like my dad's really great at it. He's really great at it. And I just want to mow the lawn. And some of you are like, well, if you want to come mow my lawn. No, I don't want to mow your lawn. I don't want to mow my own lawn, but I want to mow my dad's front yard because now it's a thing. And so I, I say that because it, may, it made me go down this wormhole about doing gardening. Like, when did this become a thing? Like, when did people start paying HOAs for not having a nice lawn? When did people start getting awards for it? Like, I know there's a garden at the start of the Bible, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like that. And then, like, when you think about human civilization, most often you hear about farming. And so there's, uh, you're trying to grow something to survive, something that produces fruit, something that you could live off of. And so this sent me down this wormhole of trying to learn the history of gardening. And here's what I found out. That usually what happens is that gardening starts with people of status and wealth and power, such as uh, the Roman civilization. They would have great gardens. And then as society be well, that began to creep down to society, the, the average everyday person would begin to grow one as well. You see the same thing in the West, in Europe, that, that begins to happen. And then even in the United States, it wasn't until after World War II when people started moving to the suburbs that all of a sudden luxury gardens start popping up because people, first of all, had the space, but second of all, were in a season of peace versus war that they were able to grow a garden. But I tell you all that because having a garden is different than having a farm. You can be successful at having a garden and actually have no fruit in your garden. You can have beautiful flowers. You, you can win awards. There are people in my neighborhood that I, I'm like, your garden is a full-time job. Like I would eat off your garden before I eat off my kitchen table because that's how nice your garden is. But that doesn't mean it's actually producing fruit. And what's interesting is as we move into the Easter season and we think about what Jesus does for us, that he takes us from death to life. I think before we can recognize that Jesus takes us from death to life, I think we need to also recognize the danger of what a, what a watered down version of life might look like. And so when we get into Mark chapter 11, um, here's our main idea. The story of the cursed fig tree provides a warning for the followers of Jesus. Keeping up appearances is a dangerous hobby. And here's our table of contents. Uh, verses 12 through 14 are just going to be this strange digression uh, in Jesus' path towards the cross. 
And then verses 15 through 19, we'll see him cleansing the temple. And then uh, in 20 through 25, we're going to see the moral of the story. So let's, get, let's pray together before we jump into the word this morning. And so Father, thank you. Thank you that you desire that we would produce fruit. In fact, you would say in John 15 that if we imbi- abide in you that, um, you, that we would produce fruit and much fruit. Yeah. And so you long for that with, uh, with us and, and it's built on our connection with you. But there is a danger of seeming like something that we are not. And so this morning, Lord, would you expose our hearts? Would you allow us to see areas where uh, maybe we have the appearance of something that isn't the actual fruitfulness of the thing that you expect for us? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 12, would say this. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, let me give a little context here because this is actually not um, the triumphal entry. It's not Palm Sunday. It's the day after. And so he has come into the city and uh, there's all of this celebration. There are people with palm leaves. We we read it this morning. People crying out, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Mark would say that right after that, when it's late in the day, that he would go to the temple, verse 11, and he would look around and realizing that it was late in the day, he left and he went to Bethany. So the next morning, he's on his way back into Jerusalem. And as he's walking by, um, he sees a fig tree and ends up cursing the fig tree. And, and I've read this text all my life. And I'm like, man, Jesus got hangry too. Because out of nowhere, like it feels like, okay, if you are, you're more famous than you've ever been. People in the streets literally crying out that you're the son of David, that you're this uh, Messiah type figure that's going to make the world right in the name of God. That people are treating you as if you are a king. And at the end of the week, you know what's coming for you, that you are going to die on a cross. Doing a little bit of gardening in between doesn't seem like the the highest priority on this week. And so what does this text have to do, A, with what's happening in the life of Jesus, and B, what's this text have to do with you and me? And so it's interesting because Mark is setting something up and and he actually has some things sandwiched together. And that's the the three blocks of text that will look like where initially we see this moment where he is cursing the tree. And then after that, it's going to be another diversion back towards the temple. And then he comes back to the tree to help us understand why he did it in the first place. But I just want you to capture some of the details of what's happening. That Jesus walks up on this tree and it says that it's in leaf. Now, I, I don't know how much you know about fig trees, this is the wormhole of my life, thinking about gardening. Um, you're going to get to hear about a, lot, a lot about gardening this week, Good Friday, and next week. Fig trees actually bloom twice. So the first time that fig trees bloom, they bloom in the spring, and they actually have leaves on them. But they, don't, they produce um, a version of their fruit, but it's not fully edible. It's not, the, it's not the ripe, good version of their fruit. And then around the the end of summer, start of fall, it will bloom again. And when it blooms again, that's when the fruit of the figs are actually available. And so when Mark says that it's not the season for figs, he's saying, hey, we're not in the latter part of the year where it would have happened, but there should have been at least some form of fruit on this tree. And so what Jesus sees is this tree that's in bloom. It's not dead. It wasn't this barren tree that had nothing on it. It was a tree that looked like it was alive. It looked like it had vitality and strength. The leaves were green and he walks up to it expecting some form of fruit to be there and the fruit's not there. Now, mind you, I wanna wanna be careful because this is not Jesus just kind of freaking out because he's hungry and he's like, hey, look, I was expecting fruit and there wasn't any fruit and so he curses a tree. He's actually setting up this idea that there's something dangerous about looking like you're alive but actually being dead. There's actually something dangerous about looking like you have all this vitality about you, but the reality is that the fruit that you should be producing isn't there. In fact, this is something that Jesus does all the time. And so there's a conversation with Jesus and the Pharisees and they're arguing with him. And Jesus was like, well, you know that a good tree can't produce bad fruit. And you know that a bad tree can't produce good fruit. And so something that's going on in you should be represented by what's happening on the outside of you. And there's something wrong when he walks up to this tree that looks like it's fully alive and then it's dead. And so Jesus curses it. And it says that the disciples heard it. I don't want you to miss that. 
Then Mark 11, starting in verse 15, would say this. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the table of the money changers and the seat of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And so again, it feels like, okay, wait a minute. This makes more sense. You were at the temple earlier. You're going back to the city. Like this is the time. It's the, the Passover season. And he shows up at the temple. But it's like, what does this fig tree thing have to do with the temple? Except for that when he, shows, when he showed up at the temple the day earlier, he was like, well, I know what this looks like, but it certainly is, isn't what it's supposed to be. So as he begins to look at what's going on in the temple, he says, okay, wait, some of you are selling, so you need to know that there's a thing called a temple tax. And what they would do is that people would set up where people could exchange money, and they would, they would exchange money at a premium, and so basically they were making money off of people for an exchange. So if you've ever been to a foreign country and you needed to do an ex a currency exchange, you know that you don't do that at the airport, because if you do that at the airport, they're, they're getting over on you. And so this is the same idea of they were profiting off of people's need to go pay the temple tax. The other thing that they were doing was, so you have to understand the way that the temple was built out. So the temple was built out in layers. Farthest from the center of the temple, the temple was this place called the Court of the Gentiles. This was the place for people who were not ethnically Jewish, who were not biologically Jewish, that if they had turned their hearts to God, that they could come and worship. And it was also the place for those who were not wealthy. Then the next step was the court for women, then the court for men, and then the, the deepest place, the Holy of Holies. And so the reason that Jesus makes mention of this is supposed to not just be a house of prayer, but a house of prayer for the nations, is because where he's standing is supposed to be this place that's supposed to be accessed for even the people who are the most far from God naturally. And in that place, they had set up shop to sell the things that people needed at a premium to go make sacrifice. So like, oh, you're trying to get close to God. Let me, let me sell you these pigeons. $79. What? I, I have no idea how much they cost. I just, just made that price up. It's just $79 sound expensive for pigeons. If you sell pigeons, that might not be, that might be market value. I have no idea. But they were exploiting people who were wanting to worship so they could gain selfish, selfishly. In fact, when you read the New Testament, one of the ways that they talk about a false teacher is a false teacher that's in it for shameful gain. And so they are selling out of this premium for people who are trying to worship and trying to be right with God in the place that is the only place that they can access. And so when Jesus walks up on this, he says, you're supposed to be this house of prayer. You're supposed to be this place of the presence of God. You're supposed to be this place where all who want to come and know of the goodness of God can receive it, but instead you've turned into a den of robbers. Or maybe, let me say it this way, you look like you have vitality and life and connection with God, but instead it's full of the dead things of the world. Let me add a layer. Uh, when you read your Bible, Genesis chapter 1, there is a garden there. And the garden is meant to be not just a, this motif of fruitfulness, but it's also meant to be the place where the presence of God and humanity, when heaven and earth overlap. Now, when we get kicked out of the garden, the Lord doesn't leave us without recourse, but uh, as you begin to read your Bible, the next place that comes is the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. And that's the place that you're supposed to, where heaven and earth are supposed to overlap. And that's where the presence of God is supposed to be, even as they're migrating through trying to get from Egypt to the land that he promised. But eventually when David, David establishes the kingdom in Jerusalem and because he spilt too much blood, he can't build the temple, but his son Solomon is meant to build the temple. And when he builds the temple, the first thing that happens is the presence of God is so thick that the priests can't even do their duties as if to show that this is the place where heaven and earth are supposed to overlap, that this is like the garden all over again. And so Jesus sees this place that is supposed to be the garden of God's presence. And instead of it being the garden of God's presence, it is this manipulative, exploitive place of commerce. And so Jesus starts flipping tables. 
Jesus starts driving people out. And, and, and I, I want to be careful, right? Like, because when we read this, like, I don't want to portray Jesus as like, you've seen the pictures, like angry pantine haired Jesus like, with, with a whip. Like, I think it's important that Mark tells you that he went the day before and he looked around. This wasn't this impulsive emotional reaction. This is Jesus pronouncing judgment against something that's, un, that's dishonoring to the Father. Something that looks like it's got life in it, but it's actually full of death. And then, verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered him, have faith in God. Or read that, come on, man. <laughs> of course it is. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Now, I, I wanna be careful. Because I think there are two ways that this text can go that are probably unhelpful and not the intent of the text. And so one of those is, if you pray hard enough and hope hard enough, you're gonna get whatever you want. So let me just tell you, Jesus was not setting up to do a duet with Will Smith and Aladdin talking about you ain't never had a friend like me. Like he's not promising you that any wish that you ask, you're going to get. Now here's the flip side. The other danger is, well, I'm carrying something that I can't forgive. Does that mean that the Lord will never forgive me at all? So I want to put this text in context because the, the, the scary thing is Peter sees what happens. He says, okay, wow, that, it really happened. And, Lord, and Jesus says, have faith in God. He's like, when you trust me in this way, you'll see this happen. And then he makes this statement that this mountain could be removed and put into the sea. Now, because I read other theologians as part of my job, I realize that sometimes theologians ask questions that I don't know that we care about. And so the amount of text that I read this week about people arguing about what geographical mountain it was was just unhelpful. I just needed you to know that. There's there no, no sermon point there. I just wanted you to know. But I think this is the point. The context of what he's talking about is that the place of God's presence the temple and the, the temple mount that's around it, that that's the this that he's referring to previously. That's what, this whole thing has this context around it. If you read uh, chapter 12, he starts talking about how the place that you have as the people of God has been removed from you because you've been unfaithful. He, the reason that he is, the thing he's accused of when he's on trial is him saying that I can tear the temple down in three days and build it back up again. Like the thing that is getting Jesus in trouble is he's making these statements about the thing that you're looking to, this appearance of you being the people of God, like this mountain represents that. And faithfulness exposes it. And so he's saying to Peter that if you understand me and you have faith in me, if you trust me in the way that you should, then you would recognize in the same way I can tell a fig tree to wither and be gone, that I can deal with the falseness of the appearance of life that's not actually there. And then he begins to lean in, but the only way that you get there is by prayer and forgiveness. And here's the thing. You can fake prayer and forgiveness and it can look like it's got life in it, but it's rotting on the inside. Let's just talk about what unforgiveness does. Because the idea of forgiveness is that forgiveness is, is, is releasing the debt of so, that somebody owes. In fact, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus would tell this story. He would tell a story of two men who owe a debt. One owes a debt of a lifetime to the king and he cannot pay it back. And the king says, I know that you can't pay this, and so I release you. That, that's Jesus' analogy for forgiveness. Now, consequently, this dude turns around, finds a dude that owes him like a day's wages, slaps him and throws him to jail. I don't know why he got to slap a dude, but he slaps him. There was probably a Will Smith joke. I'm just going to leave it there. You can think through it yourself. <laughs> slaps the guy, has him thrown in jail, and the king's like, do you realize how deep the debt you owed was? And you're going to hold somebody hostage for this? 
Now, here's the thing. You know who takes the loss? The king. He doesn't get this lifetime's worth of wages back, and, so, and yet he's released himself of, of worrying about a debt that's ever, never going to actually be settled. And so this guy gets to go scot-free, and yes, there's, there's some, some freedom for him, but this person is no longer sitting there stewing and frustrated like, when am I going to get that back? Right. Think about it in your own life. When you've, by the grace of the Lord, been able to forgive somebody whether they deserved it or not, how much that freed you up. How much that lets you lift your head and breathe in again. And so Jesus is making this analogy that the deep of the, the depth of what you've owed the Lord that's been forgiven you, that should be the primary motivator for the way that you forgive others. And here's the thing. Some of us can walk around looking like we're full of life rotting on the inside because of the unforgiveness that's in us. Some of us, let me, let me jump off of that. To pray with faith and not have doubt in our hearts. That's just real talk. There's a reason why in every church across the West, the least attended thing is prayer meetings. Because we know we're supposed to do it. Like I've never walked into a building full of Christians and said, hey, I'm gonna preach a sermon on prayer and people be like, are we supposed to do that? Like we know that we're called to that, but to pray and believe, especially when we're not seeing results. To be called into the depth of I'm trusting you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk and operate as if I've already received, even though my external world doesn't show that yet. What a, what a weighty thing. But think about the danger of the opposite. To walk around like a functional atheist that doesn't really believe that the Lord can do anything, but you just, well, I'm, this, oh, this is the part where I'm supposed to, yeah. And Jesus is hammering on this reality of the way that we pray, the way that we forgive speaks to something being alive on the inside that provides life for the outside. So what do we do with that? The story of the cursed fig tree provides a warning for the followers of Jesus. Keeping up appearances is a dangerous hobby. Um, I, I'm gonna teach you a term. Well, not a term, a phrase. Uh, I made it up this morning, so um, you are the second people to know it. It's called the eavesdropping fallacy. Here's what it is. It's the mistaken idea that you're hearing God's message for someone else and therefore it doesn't apply to you. And sometimes that's awesome. Sometimes it's true, right? Like you just happen to be in the space where the Lord's doing something with somebody and he's not, he's not talking to you. You're like, you get a front row seat to the Lord transforming somebody's life. But more often than not, if he's letting you hear it, then that means there's something in it for you. So you're not just happen to be in earshot of somebody's private conversation and now you got some details. The Lord's trying to do something in your heart. And the reason that I'm worried about the eavesdropping fallacy is I'm not sure that there's any season of our lives that makes us more susceptible to that than Easter. Because here's what the church has done. We've made it this outward focused event that says, go find all the people in your life that don't know Jesus. We're gonna bring them, we're gonna make it about them. And then we have this kind of, kind of cultural conversation. We're like, okay, don't do anything weird, pastor. Let's cut out all the songs about the blood because that's weird. And I'm like, like, don't do that. So we got them all in this week so that way we can't do it next week. And then I'll be the good example the week before. So people are like, I want what you want. And the whole time we're thinking, okay, the Lord's gonna do something in somebody else's life. And he's talking to you. The whole time he's trying to draw you in, trying to, trying to transform your heart. And so I just, I just wanna warn us before we keep going down the Holy Week path that he's not just letting us hear somebody else's conversation because isn't that the danger of the text? It says in 12 through 14 that he spoke to the fig tree and it says that the disciples heard it. But the strange thing is that if you read from 15 to 19, that it says that they heard, they saw what he was doing and they saw the authority with which he was teaching with. And it says that the Pharisees and the scribes, they heard it. And so it wasn't a lack of hearing. It wasn't a lack of access. It was a lack of responsiveness to what they heard. 
So Peter and the disciples say, hey, you said something and I'm seeing it come to pass. The Pharisees and the scribes said, you said something and I'm threatened by it. I need to get you out of the way. And maybe that's a really clear indicator of the difference of the fruitful life and the life that has death in it that does not want to be submitted to Jesus. Because the life that's going to be fruitful, that even when the Lord by his grace prunes with a hard word, it actually produces more fruit in us. But those that are opposed to the things of God, it's it's a threat to them. So what I could do this morning is walk through this diagnostic of, well, if you're wondering if you have fruitful life in you or if you have death in you, look at this. But I actually think maybe the easiest diagnostic is a, is a quote that one of my mentors, Brian Jarrett, used to give me all the time. The proof of your desire is your pursuit. And, and you get that, right? Um, we're not terribly far removed from our second born being born. And so I am a sympathetic husband. And if Sky had cravings at night, I had cravings at night. I feel like that was the most supportive thing that I could do. Couldn't help carry the child, couldn't help deal with the morning sickness. I could help with the cravings. And so if in the middle of the night, she was like, I want ice cream. The proof of my desire is my pursuit. And so finding something that's open 24-7. If I got to go to IHOP to get, an ice, get some ice cream, I'll go to IHOP and get some ice cream. I wouldn't recommend it. But if you got you to do what you got to do. Because the proof of your desire is the way that you would pursue the thing that you desire. That's a silly example. Maybe a, a, a more serious example is maybe you're an entrepreneur. And you have this dream in your heart of something either that doesn't exist or could exist in a better way. And people thought you were foolish. You walked into banks with business plans and they said, we're not giving you money for that. You talk to family members and they're like, oh, why don't you keep your day job? You, you tried getting patents or you tried um, getting uh, people to join the team to understand what you're doing and people looked at you like you were insane. Maybe you uh, gave up some things. Maybe you lived off a credit card and some loans trying to get to the thing that you wanted to get to. And the day that you get there, the win isn't that you got there and proved everybody wrong. The win was that you believed in something deep enough to actually chase after it. The proof of your desire is your pursuit. And the reason that I say that is because I think the desire for the fruitful life precedes the actual reality of the fruitful life. But the only way that you prove that you desire the fruitful life is if you pursue it. It's not just what I think, it's what Peter thinks. Second Peter chapter one, starting verse three, would say this. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Let me summarize it. He's writing to these people who have been pushed out of their home. They have been, they're a part of a diaspora and they're, they're trying to write themselves according to the Lord in terms of, okay, how am I supposed to understand my experience? And he says that the Lord is providing for you everything that you need for life and godliness. He's like that by the knowledge of him that you can partake of his divine nature. So let me say it this way, that you could have life instead of the sinful corruptness of the world that is death. That because of Jesus, that he's providing for you everything that you need to go from the death that's around you to the life that you desperately need. Then verse five, he would say this. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me put the two things together, that he has provided everything that you need for life instead of death. 
for godliness instead of unrighteousness, for fruitfulness instead of barrenness. And so he says, so therefore, listen to these qualities that he's laying out, that you have faith and virtue, that and he lists a set of qualities. But the thing that I want you to capture is verse five, the thing that holds it together. Make every effort. The proof of your desire is your pursuit. And what I'm fearful of is that we have luxury gardens that have no fruit. Because we've somehow believed that we're not supposed to be pursuing the things of the Lord. Um, this is a D.A. Carson quote. Nobody drifts into holiness. Like you don't just kind of inertia like you're in the, in the Pacific Ocean and just kind of bob your way towards holiness. It just doesn't happen. You strive for it. Like, like when you read the New Testament, like the end of Paul's letters, get a little bit, like he, he begins to give all of this understanding of the Lord and then he'll say things like strive, toil, endure. Like this kind of language that, that means there's this strained effort towards something. He would talk of himself that I have not yet reached the prize, but I strain towards the goal of the high calling of God that the pursuit that he had was the proof of the desire of what he wanted to be. And I just want to invite us on this Palm Sunday when the king walks amongst us, looking slowly for where life and death is. I can't answer the question because I can't see on the inside of whether you have life or death. Maybe this list of faith and virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection and love, that may be, that may be some fruit on the tree that might help us evaluate where, whether life is being produced in you or not. But I ultimately can't tell. But what I can tell is that the proof of your desire is your pursuit. That if you're leaning in and saying, Jesus, make me more like you, Mature me in my faith. Help me to lay down the things of the world that I've so often clung to and instead let me run to you as faithful and true. It's a good shot that you're desiring to be fruitful. And then here's the promise. Believe him as if you've already received the fruit. Can I just encourage some of you? Look back where you used to be. Like, I'm not just talking about, like, when, usually when we say that, that's like, like before Jesus and after Jesus. But even after Jesus, yeah. I was a punk. <laughs> like, I, I prayed the prayer. I was trying to do the stuff. But then I moved into this kind of self-righteous and title where I'm smarter than everybody now. Looking down my nose at other people's sin, like, I can't believe you struggle with that. Have you read your Bible? I don't know why I got like, it's like got a little neck turn in there. Like I just got some attitude. And though I certainly loved Jesus, I was so immature and unhelpful, unfruitful and ineffective for him. And I, I look back at that and say, man, the mercy of God to reveal to me that I don't get to stand on the podium with them and we both get medals for my righteousness. So for some of you, I just, I just want to encourage you. He has already been doing that in you, making you more like him. But what I want to encourage you to is don't stop there. Because this is the beauty of the gospel. It is not just this prayer that you pray so that way you don't go to hell when all this is over. It is actually this life that you live, that you grow in increasing measure of receiving the grace that comes from it. And so I want to encourage you that this season is not just for everybody else. That's an eavesdropping fallacy. But instead that the Lord is inviting you to run after him that you might be fruitful, that you might experience more life and the proof of your desire for that life is the fact that you'd run after it. Let's pray. So Jesus, I thank you. I thank you in your matchless wisdom that you would call out to what looks like it's alive and show that there's no fruit in it. I'm thankful that um, as we continue to journey through this week with you, 
that there will be a moment when you say, because of our sin natures, there's no life in any of us. So I will take the curse of death upon me and I will hang upon a tree that you might find life. The Lord, my prayer is that because we, so many of us know that, that it wouldn't just be a historical fact or the theme for a, a, a heightened spiritual season, but it would be the thing that drives our pursuit. You've made a way to life for us. And you've given us everything that we need to have that life. And there's marks of that life that surround us. Things like faith and virtue and knowledge and godliness and steadfastness and brotherly affection and love. Like all of those things are, are, are key markers for a life that produces fruit. But the important link is that we are participating with you, that we, in obedience to your leading, we, in partnership with your spirit, are desiring to grow into more maturity. So Lord, would you help us? Would you show us where there's leaves but no fruit in our life? Would you show us where there's the, the appearance of inviting in your presence, but, but it, it's really not there? And would you call us to live that out? And I pray for the person under the sound of my voice that's battling unforgiveness. I pray for the person that's battling prayerlessness, that in them you would awaken fruit that's produced in the way that they forgive others and the way that they trust you in prayer. There's a litany of other places that we could speak to, but Lord, you know where we are. You see us and you speak to where there's life lacking in us. And would you give us the courage to pursue you into new life? It's in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Again, thanks for watching this message online. And here's our hope that you didn't just hear the word of God, but that it compels you to follow the way of Jesus. Here's what we mean by that. We're not just giving you information, but we believe that there's steps that you take afterwards to obey Jesus, to serve the world around you, to give sacrificially, and to go to others who haven't heard the message. And so one, we would love to know you, particularly if you're in the Southern California area. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello, you can send us a digital connect card, and we would love to follow up with you, just get to know you better. But we also hope that you didn't just hear a message and then just stow it away somewhere, but it compels you to obey and follow the way of Jesus. Uh, we pray that you do that in community. That's the best way to live this out. You can live it out. We just don't believe you should live it out alone. Uh, on top of that, we, we believe that this is an opportunity to serve. And whether that's you serving uh, the church or the community around you, that those who follow Jesus reflect Jesus by the way that they serve. And then we would ask that you give. Giving is not something that is uh, just kind of a tradition in the church. It's evidence that you fully trust Jesus in every dimension of your life. And then finally, we're praying that you go, that you would share this with someone else, that if the Lord has impacted you by his word to see Jesus better and love him more deeply, that you'd invite others to do the same by either sharing this message with them or entering into community with them and sharing what the Lord has done. So we're excited to hear from you, to connect with you, and to hear about what the Lord's doing through his word and in your life.